No, Babylon 5 was recently picked up for its fifth and final season, but the cast and crew haven't exactly spent the summer lounging poolside. They're finishing up their second telefilm for TNT, a prequel to the series entitled The Beginning. And of course, we recently shot through the jump gate to catch up with B5 and saw firsthand how it all began. Well, then we'll have to stick with my plan. Hell, I never plan to live forever anyway. Actually, Bruce Boxleitner, a.k.a. Captain Sheridan, shaved off a couple of years with his new look. The prequel takes the crew back in time, ten years before the pilot even took place. At the time of the uh, Minbari War starting up, he was a commander on board Lexington and a much younger man, uh, so he looks differently. Basically, it's, uh, we're in the middle of the prequel Babylon 5. This is about ten years before the Babylon stations are happening. And it takes place during the, probably the most seminal event that every character in this show went through, and that was the Earth Mimbari War. Bridge to engine room. Do we have power yet? What's involved really is just trying to encapsulate the entire scope of it. The work took about three years to play out. So we use a device of narrative intercutting, uh, going back to Londo in uh, the future, 20 years down the road from Babylon 5 approximately, to tell the story. And we sort of go in and out along the way. And uh, this is still uh, the story I wanted to tell. We may very well blow up right alongside the enemy, but at least we'll have a fighting chance of taking them out with us. Look for the prequel to air in January. And hey, look at this, folks. We have made it down to the war room. And joining us today is Kevin Stevens, author of the upcoming Pocket Books release, Artifacts from the Future, A History of Star Trek Memorabilia. And Richard Arnold is here, Star Trek consultant and former associate to Gene Roddenberry himself for 15 years. And he's no stranger to the war room. He is Warren James, host of Hour 25, a science fiction radio show in Los Angeles. Guys, welcome. Here's my first topic. My son Brandon and I are out the other day. We buy a couple of Star Wars action figures. He wants Obi-Wan Kenobi, but he says, Dad, we should buy two so I can play with one and we can leave the other in the package. What is, what's the deal with this? Are we, are, are we spending too much money on merchandise that's not really gonna be worth anything anyway, Kevin? Yeah, I'm sure we are. Um, and, you know, in terms of wanting to keep Obi-Wan Kenobi in the package, um, when I was a kid, when I was eight, mm -hmm. and I bought my Captain Kirk action figure, I tore him out and I played with him, and then I found out when I turned 25 that he was worth, you know, $300. Good move. So the next time I went out and bought Captain Kirk, I kept him in the package, but I was 25 years old as opposed to 8 years old. And I think that's the difference. You know, um, when you're a kid, you want to play with the toys. You don't want to put one in the closet. Well, the, the thing with the don't take it out of the packaging, buy two, think about it. That's a ploy by the toy companies to double their sales. Taking advantage, Taking advantage of, the of the fans. No, I, I disagree, though. I mean, no matter what your age is, if you're buying something like that, you should be buying it because you enjoy it. I did. And, and staring at it inside the plastic bubble pack is not enjoying it. Yeah, it is. And no, it isn't. Well, hey, I'm the one that's buying it. it okay, you know, but, why are you, but how can you be enjoying it when you can't touch it or I, play with it or do anything because with it? I get you're just looking at the possible, your possible monetary no. return. No. Richard, are you agreeing no. with Warren James? How can you possibly James enjoy something no. when you don't uh, take it out and do anything with it? I, I don't you necessarily... <laughs> Warren's not done. Back yeah, with Warren's not done. What do you think, Richard? Do you agree? If you're going to, as a kid, go out and get something and play with it, that's fine. And I'm sure the manufacturers are more than happy that <laughs> later on they're going to have to buy another one anyway. Right. Uh, they manufacture now so much because they know that people are going to buy them for their kids, they're going to buy them for themselves, they're going to put one away in a vault, they're going to have one on display somewhere, and they want people to buy that way, which is, I think, a lot of the problem with what's happening with merchandising now. The most important thing that fuels collecting, for me, mm -hmm. is nostalgia. And that is the emotional satisfaction I get from having that Captain Kirk I played with when I was eight and, and my mom threw away in a, or sold in a garage sale. That's the emotional satisfaction I get from having it in the package the way that it was when I bought it when I was eight years old. It's nostalgia, and I do get emotional satisfaction from that, and I think that's okay. Yeah, but see, when you, when you take a book or anything like that and you turn it into something to be collected as a thing to be collected, 
then you've objectified it and you've changed it into something that it isn't. It's no longer a book to be read and enjoyed. It's no longer a toy to be played with. It's no longer a model to be built and enjoyed for the act of building. It becomes a thing with nothing more than its than its monetary value. Sir. Kevin, what would? But it's not about the monetary value. That's the point. It's about the nostalgia. It's about the satisfaction of of having that. Um, toy that I played with as a kid. I, d I never intend to sell that. I don't. I don't. You know, look at the. Uh, well, then open it up and play with it. It's a toy. I'm, I'm, I don't with play that. with dolls <laughs> anymore. <laughs> play with that I don't play with dolls anymore. years old, Warren. What's the matter? Now let me ask you guys. Richard, you're an expert. Now when it comes to autographs, I hear there's actually fake ones out there. Is that true? Unfortunately, about half of the autographs being sold. Half. About half are now fake. Okay. This we have to talk about. We're going to talk about that and comic books when we come back, folks. There's lots more here in the war room. So you at home, don't go anywhere. We'll see you in a minute. All right, welcome back to SF Vortex. We are still in the war room with Star Trek expert Richard Arnold, SF radio host Warren James, and author Kevin Stevens. Now, Richard, you touched briefly on the fake autograph thing, so the only way for me to make sure that I get a real, authentic autograph is to stand in line and watch him write Bill Shatner? Well, Bill doesn't do that very often, but uh, yeah, if, if it's that important to you that you get a real one, then right. get in that line, or there are a few licensees uh, authorized either by a licensing area like Paramount for Star Trek, for instance, uh -huh. uh, who do get legitimate autographs from the actors and have them, you know, QVC, for instance, only sells real autographs. But why, I mean, why go after an autograph anyway? Why spend hours waiting in line to get somebody to scribble some ink on a piece of paper right. and that's Unless all you're getting? Why not spend that, if you're going to spend that time waiting, why don't you just take a minute or two minutes and talk with them for a few seconds, carry away that memory, and don't waste your time having them scribble on a piece of paper. Well, I, I may surprise you. I don't disagree with you because I've never been an autograph collector, but yeah, the, some of the people who will stand in lines for half of the convention and not see the actors speak, they'd rather be in line to get their autograph. I, I don't understand it, but they They're are there, and that's why there's this huge market for fake autographs. Yeah, well, in a way, I understand it, because at least you're, you're, you're carrying away something physically to kind of commemorate the experience, but I do agree with yeah, Warren. What about taking not a picture of experience. you standing there getting the autograph, looking at the camera? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. While why not take away some memory of a brief conversation with them? But, you know, autograph collecting is a very big area. There are whole yeah. magazines yeah. devoted to it. And yeah. some yeah. autographs so are worth a lot of money. Before I get I'd on like to have one of Jean's. Before I get on to my next topic, an autograph is about a check. Yeah. I don't care about it. <laughs> oh, wow. Before I move on to my next topic, real quick, top three sci-fi autographs. Who would they be, in your opinion? Oh, um, Harrison Ford is a fairly hard autograph to get. There's a lot of fake Harrison Fords out there. Gene Roddenberry certainly is a very hard one to get. That would be huge. Uh, George Lucas, I don't know that he signs a lot. But why not people, uh, if you're Spielberg, looking at, at yeah. famous science fiction people, why not people like Heinlein, Heinlein Asimov, yeah. Clark, right. Alfred Let's press old Bester. This is not for these right. young kids who are collecting. Ah, okay. Let's oh. move on to comic books, gentlemen. Okay. Oh boy. When I was a kid, I bought a Superman comic book, Batman, or, you know, the Fantastic Four, to read the darn read thing. Read it. Nowadays, yeah. it's let's seal it away real quick, and you don't even bother to read it. It's just to have, to say. Nah, Kevin, a... are you into that? What's your take on the comic book? You buy comic books to read them. And uh, yeah, when I'm finished reading them, I might put it away to hang on to for posterity or whatever, but uh, I buy that stuff to read it. Yeah. I, I think when you when you buy comic books because it's got a special hologram cover or because it's the first issue of the, uh, you know, fourth incarnation of the new X Men, mm -hmm. you're 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 losing the joy of it. Richard, and what's your uh, take on the comic book issue? Ooh, well, I stopped reading comic books when I moved on to books. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that was around the time I went from ten to twelve cents. As they read them. Mm -hmm. 
in a plastic bag with a cardboard back, and I stuck it away in a closet. No. But you know, you no, look, at, it, look at the comic book market in the last couple of years. It's been really depressed, and the reason is there was so much speculation. There were so many people going out buying comic books, putting them away, hoping they were going to make money on them. They didn't, and now nobody's buying comic books. The market's been depressed for a couple of years, and the comic book makers are figuring out. It's the story, stupid. You gotta right. have yeah. good I stories mean, it's, 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 and it's keep what the readers. Yeah. Uh, it's as soon as you take something, as soon as you take something and turn it into something to be collected, as soon exactly. as you take exactly. a comic book and you put it in a plastic sleeve and seal it up, you've objectified it. You've turned it into something other than the thing what it is. Oh, but I have no problem doing that after I've read it. I have no problem with doing that after I've read it. But when yeah. you when you buy a polybagged comic book that you never open and you never read it. That's You've that's destroyed insane. what it is. That's You've insane. destroyed what it is because it isn't something for that purpose. I it's agree. meant to be read I, I and agree. enjoyed. I so real quick, let me go around. Quick bite. Has collecting taking ha, has this collecting world taken all the fun out of comics and the action figures and all this stuff, Richard? Absolutely. The tail is now wagging the dog when it comes to collecting. Right. The, the, I mean, I, I'm not going to point any fingers here, but there are certain agencies, if you will, who are really pushing to have more and more and more merchandise out, and it's because it's very profitable. Kevin, yes or no? I think that it can. I also think that the fans have a lot of power over that. Just like I was talking about with the comic book market, right. things are changing because the fans revolted. Warren, yeah. real no. quick, yes or no? Yeah, the, the, the collecting is really damaging the stuff because the, price, the things are being turned into things that they're not. The prices are being driven up. How can you enjoy it? There you go. I got to get out of here, folks. That's it for the War Room. I want to thank my guests, Kevin Stevens, Richard Arnold, and Warren James. Don't you at home go anywhere, folks. When we come back, we've got viewer mail and some news from Transylvania. That's right, folks. Drax back, and he's coming to L.A. Stay tuned. <laughs>